comes in. A certain behavior remains simple up to a certain intensity, but past that intensity it becomes something else. In particular, let's deal here with metals, and let's assume that instead of stopping here, the load, we bring it all the way up here. That you really increase the intensity of the load that the metal has to carry. And so let's imagine a more concrete example. We're going to bring it up to here so I can show it here. At that point, a singularity appears called the plastic point. I don't know why it's called plastic because it has nothing to do with plastics in the sense of, you know, in the plastics that toys are made out of or plastics. It's, it's plastic versus elastic. That's just a terminology that physicists use. I'm giving you the name just because that's the way it is. At the plastic point, something happens. Let's, which can be diagrammed this way. Let me give you an example. Imagine that you just bought yourself a new Mercedes, right? And your Mercedes, the body, of course, is made of metal. And you're going to park your car in front of your house and you're showing it to your friends. Look, this is my new Mercedes, man. And then comes one of your friends who happens to have a big butt. A huge butt, as a matter of fact. And he goes, oh, I love your Mercedes, man, and starts leaning against the, the door of your Mercedes with his big butt. Now, this is the, your friend's big butt. This is your friend's big butt on drugs, my love. <laughs> this, is, this is your friend's big butt. This is the door of your Mercedes, right? So he puts his butt in, that's a load. Now he's pushing, not pulling, but it doesn't matter. Brains, you know, it, 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 create, it at first creates a reversible, you know, a regular person with such a big butt would simply create a bump, but that then bumps back and returns to where it was. But with your friend who happens to have a huge butt, it reaches the plastic, the plastic point, it creates a deformation, creates a dent, in your car, in your in your uh, in your car's door, and when he takes his butt out, I mean, when he when you go, what the hell are you doing, man? You're doing this on my new Mercedes. He takes his butt out, so the load now diminishes to zero, but not where not not now where it is. The guy has created a permanent dent in your Mercedes. So of course, you're like going totally crazy. You see what you did, you big butt freak. You know, you've completely destroyed my Mercedes. I'm going to take it back to the repair shop because now it doesn't matter that you took the load off, it creates a permanent deformation. So even the simplest of becomings can give rise to something else, can become something else, give rise to a permanent dent if the intensity happens to be high enough. So, I'm gonna kind of stop right here to take some questions. We're gonna continue these ideas when we come back later on. I'm gonna give you a slightly more elaborate theory of patterns of becoming because these patterns right now use only algebra, as I said at the beginning of the class. I need to move to the differential calculus because that's what Deleuze uses. Deleuze doesn't really use these examples. But I remember that Deleuze is the philosopher of difference. And so he's gonna prefer anything that has anything to do with differences. The differential calculus is one such thing, and the differential calculus is all about rates of change. That is, the, a rate of change basically simply is the, the rapidity or slowness with which something changes. The rapidity or slowness with which something becomes other than itself, even just quantitatively. But of course, at some critical point, qualitatively. So we're going to need a little bit more math, not equations, but more conceptual math. And then we can begin getting to the whole Deleuzian view, because now we have all the elements. And at the end, we'll make contact with the ethics of Spinoza. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing when we come back from lunch. Meanwhile, we have five full minutes for questions. Question. Yeah. So the economists when they're forecasting, use this um, exact same model in order to, uh, like, the deformation of changes through trends in their indices. 
is this correct? Yeah, that's correct. Or, or any kind of change in an economic variable, right? For instance, you can say, well, how is the demand for cars going to change? And this, you know, let me open another page here. Or say, how is the demand for iPods or the demand for Walkmans going to change the more iPods I produce? Is it going to be this is number of iPods or any product, right? And this is number sold, number of units sold. Can I just produce more and more and more? And I'm going to be selling more and more and more? Or will there be a point of saturation? Which I stop, uh, which I don't, I stop selling. In fact, it would not look like that. It would look just like a J that we just did. It would look more like I'm selling lots of them, but then all of a sudden, I'm, you know, if this is number of sold items, then I'm not selling anymore. That's what they they call diminishing returns, which means that you will be selling and making profits up to a point, but then. Demand becomes saturated. Everybody now has an iPod, so only a few people are buying iPods. At some point, everybody has an iPod, so you're not selling any more iPods. Demand has become saturated. So yes, economists also use these curves to plot, to give visual form to becomings. In the case, in that case, is the, the the becomings of demand and supply. Right? There are other economic phenomena which have the opposite form. They begin with, let me just see how, oh yeah, they begin, they are like this. Uh, fax machines are a very good example. When you have, and this is, again, this is number of, no, this is uh, number of half machines, let me see how, you, how this would go. Well, let me just step, sidestep that to tell you the, the thing. Imagine that you're producing fax machines. The first three buyers have a fax machine, but they can only send faxes to each other, basically. The fax machine has very little use. So in this case, would be number of fax machines. And this would be usefulness, or the use value of fax machines, usefulness, or the utility of fax machines. At the beginning, the utility of fax machines is nothing. That's why it would begin here at nothing. And even as they begin increasing in numbers, you know, as there's five fa fax machines in the whole city, there's ten fax machines in the whole city, you, even, you don't even use your fax machine. But there will be an inflection point at which all of a sudden there's a thousand fax machines, and all of a sudden the fax machine increases in value enormously, because then I mean, you can send faxes to a hundred people. By the time, and then, you know, by the time you have, like, say, ten thousand fax machines, the usefulness begins increasing constantly. Because the more fax machines there are, the more you use your fax machine. There are, now everybody has fax machines, so you now you deal everything you used to deal with the postal service by sending faxes. Right? This applies to number of internet customers, number of internet websites, uh, anything that displays network effects. So when, where, whereas some commodities saturate the use value right away, that is, they are very useful at the beginning, but then they become saturated. All the commodities are very, are almost useless at the beginning, but they increase in value. And they use those same curves to plot those patterns of becoming. They becoming useful of a particular product. Did I see hands? So to track, to track the imminent patterns of becoming of humankind and the human species, what do we use? History, and we plug in variables. It sounds kind of like social science. Uh, in, in some ways, right? I mean, how do we transfer this sort of observation of the becoming of specific metals and beyond to a much more complex reality of us? Well, that, that has been the struggle of social science all along, right? From the beginning, they, they had physics envy. Adam Smith has, had physics envy. Ricardo, the other great classical, you know, Portuguese uh, economist, had physics envy. They, wanted to be like physics. They wanted to use mathematics to capture certain patterns of becoming in demand and supply. Sociology is the same thing. The problem is that humans have...